Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection as usual, right? Um, today I would like to tell you about Voronoi diagrams, which was kind of a really cool, uh, very visually appealing way to organize, well, let's say distances or distances diagrammatically, and it's very, very applicable. I try to convince you that it's really, really applicable, very easy definition. And uh, well, it's certainly applicable as you will see kind of, it's certainly applicable for everything involving distance, um, but there are some, then some very fun applications, uh, which I find very uh, surprising and unexpected and they kind of pop out of nowhere. Um, and I, that's kind of the theorem for today, like the applications in this case in graph theory, I wouldn't have expected the application in graph theory of this concept, uh, we'll see what it is. So let's just jump right into it. and. Well, maybe you find application in graph theory also very surprising. And I hope, of course, I hope you like it. Uh, so here is kind of my blueprint example of a Voronoi diagram, abbreviated VD, because I'm just super lazy, of course. Um, so it's this idea, I'm uh, going to run a Mathematica program in a second, which is, of course, like everything linked down in the description. So it's this idea and it kind of works in any dimension, but let's stay with the plane here, R2 and we take the usual distance. So Euclidean metric, if you are an expert at it, Euclidean metric, it's kind of the distance between two points. And what you do is you have cells and the cells work as follows. So you fix a certain number of points. These are those little black points. Here, this one, for example, uh, this one and this one and so on. So a lot of those points. And you kind of partition the plane into those funny cells. So these guys are called seeds. So here's another seed. And it was those funny cells. So the cell is, for example, this grayish area here, this whole beast here. The seat is just the point, and the cell is the whole beast. And you kind of partition the plane uh, into the points which are closest to a given point. So everything here in this grayish cell, those are the points that are closest to the seat, so that they're further away from, from all the other points. Right? So here's another example in this, what is it, a brown? Nish, maybe, <laughs> color, this point is closest to this one and all the other distances, whatever, there are quite a few, they're larger than the other, well, the distance to the brown seat, let's call it the brown seat. So it ends up in the brown area. You kind of distinguish or partition your, um, your R2 into those cells. So let me run Mathematica for you to really get a feeling uh, of what's going on. So here's Mathematica, as I said, uh, link is in the description. And the seats are now, well, with this aims here and you can kind of pull them. So if you move the seat, obviously the cell associated to the seat will move as well because those are the points that are closest to the seat. So let's do, make an example here. So let's say you have a point at the very far to the uh, northeast here. So somewhere here, um, clearly it's closest to this point all other points are further away. But if I move my, yeah, my seat uh, to the far north or northeast, um, you, well, of course, uh, the cells will change. And it's pretty cool. So you can play around with it if you want. Uh, if things get very, very close, it kind of looks funny. So there's a, a very, well, a straight line um, boundary between them. I should have set that points on the boundary. They kind of, uh, well, this could happen, right? A point like here on this boundary is equally far away from those two points, but let's let's ignore the boundary anyway. Uh, there are only a few points on the boundary. Anyway, so this is a cool way of uh, dividing your, well, it's pretty cool, dividing your um, R2 into those cells. And as you can see, they already look like cells. So let's zoom into some applications. Okay, pretty easy picture, right? So you have R2, you have a few seats, they're somewhere in R2 and you get cells associated to those seats. And maybe a good way to think about them. So here's kind of a, a real life example of where this is really applicable. So for example, here on this map, um, the seats would be the airports in the US. I haven't checked how, much, how up to date this map is, but it looks pretty reasonable to me. So you have kind of more airports along uh, the coasts and fewer airports in the middle. Um, and how can you see that? Well, because the uh, Voronoi cells are now measuring the distance of a given point from the airports. So somewhere here will be a seat, for example, maybe here, maybe here, 
and here will be a lot of seeds. I can't even see them. <laughs> too many. It was probably too many. But you get the point. And it kind of just measures the distance between the various airports. And yeah, so this is a pretty cool way of um, kind of illustrating uh, airports in this case in the United States. But you kind of can think of various real life examples or examples from science that you could throw or that you can use those uh, Voronoi diagrams to just kind of model them and to kind of visually see what's going on. Here, my point would be that in the middle, the cells are pretty big. So uh, each airport, so the, the airport density is small and yeah, it's a boundary, it's a boundary, it's a boundary. It's also the boundary, but anyway, it's co along the coasts, um, the airport density is much higher. So the Voronoi cells are much smaller. That's something you can very, very easily, beautifully see in this Voronoi diagram. And my point would be now, yeah, sure, this has applications in real life everywhere. Imagine you want to uh, map the supermarkets of a city and you just imagine the, all supermarkets are equal, of course. So the only thing that it kind of matters to, for customers would be the di distance and you draw those Voronoi cells and you would see how supermarkets are arranged along the city, uh, schools, um, sometimes um, the children have kind of the right to go to the closest school. So you might do the same map, like mapping schools and Voronoi cells, cells in biology, they already look like cells, right? And so on and so on. So definitely, I, I kind of think this idea is so beautiful. Uh, by the way, roughly 100 years old, uh, maybe older. Some people have probably drawn those diagrams before. It's just extremely powerful way to illustrate difference, uh, diagrammatically distance, right? So diagrammatically distance, very, very powerful. And it's pretty cool. Uh, what I would like to talk about now is kind of a less, the less obvious applications, because this is pretty applicable, actually. So as I said, it's not really surprising if you have seen the first examples like airports, supermarkets, or cells, or whatever, that this should have some applications, right? Whenever distance is involved in some sense. But there are also some less obvious applications of Voronoi diagrams, which I'm going to explain now. Um, and what we need to look at are those DT triangulations. So I don't dare to pronounce the name here. So I always got confused. To me, I, I don't know. I don't know. To me, this name looks very French, but actually it's Russian. Um, so I have no idea how to pronounce this name. I just call them DT tri triangulations. So what is a DT triangulation? The DT triangulation is, well, you start with a set of seats. So in this case, we have four seats. So, so here, one, two, three, four. And the D triangulation would be a triangulation of the associated graph that you see, if you want. So here in the uh, left picture, it looks like this. And you kind of can decide to put the edge in the middle. And in the right picture, you put it uh, in the middle in the opposite way. And the, the, it's a DT triangulation, not just any plane super triangulation. I shouldn't call triangulation stupid. Not any plane triangulation. If you can draw now, it's kind of fun, fun game. It's kind of, uh, kind of maximalized or minimalized towards a certain property. So not any old triangulation, but kind of a maximal one or a minimal one, depends a little bit how you want to call it. So it works as follows. You draw a circle around three points. So three points always nicely on a circle. This is a horrible circle that I could draw. And within this circle, you're not allowed to have any other point, right? So you have 5 million points and you have for every th three pairs of, uh, um, of uh, seats here along a triangle, you have a circle, you draw those circles and no other point is allowed to lie in those circles. So maybe on the right-hand side, it's a better example. So on the, on the left-hand side, you, you have those two circles and you can actually check if it's easy to see that all the points or the other points are outside of that circle. Here it's not the case. So for this triangulation, you would draw the circle uh, for this point, this point, and this point here. This red one. And as you can see, the other point is in this inside of the circle. So this is not a DT triangulation, right? So I say it again. It's not, not even obvious that this thing exists, right? So let me say it again what it is. You draw points in the plane. Okay, you can triangulate them. That's no problem. But your triangulation should have a certain property, and it should be the circle property. Whenever you draw a circle around all those all those three points along a triangle, no other point is allowed to be inside of that circle. So it's kind of a minimal triangulation, if you want, in a certain sense. And it's absolutely not clear why this should exist. Uh, it, as you can even see in this small example, there are two possible triangulations. 
one is dt and one is not dt, so not dt. Um, and yeah, it's, it's four points, right? So now imagine you have 5 million and 12 points. Why on earth should those things exist? And you kind of can imagine if they exist, they should be very special. Kind of minimizing, minimizing, minimalizing, minimizing a certain property. Um, this should be very special. But do they exist? Hmm. I can't tell. Turns out that you can use Voronoi diagrams to prove existence, which is kind of the first theorem for today. Um, and the theorem is that those Voronoi diagrams, which kind of obviously exist, you just draw them. And those triangulations, they actually do it to one another. It's kind of a fun, fun way of doing it. Um, it actually gives you an a very, very ef efficient way to find those uh, triangulations. Um, it works as follows. So you have your triangulation. So this is dt, uh, this is my dt, and this is my Voronoi diagram. Um, it works as follows. So if you have a triangulation, you kind of draw those uh, circles, and the midpoint of the circles will be the seats for your Voronoi diagram. So in this case, the midpoint, so here's a circle, for example. So go through three, uh, go through those three points here, this one this one and this one, and it has a seat in the middle. Very good. You do that for all circles, for all triangles. And what you get are uh, the seats of the Voronoi cell, uh, sorry, the, the boundaries of the Voronoi cell. And you can, con if you could just connect them by straight lines, something like this, these should all be straight lines. You get the corresponding Voronoi cells for uh, the seats, right? So my bet. So the seats are the same in both cases. And the midpoint of the circles will be kind of the boundary point of those Voronoi cells. Maybe on the right-hand side, it's easier to see. So this point here should be this point, And then uh, the midpoint of the circles here, it's, it's very cluttered, uh, clustered. And that's what you want. So that's how you can draw Voronoi cells. And of course, if you have Voronoi cells, you can undo the process. So this is going from dt to vd. And you can undo the process going from vd to dt. So they're really uh, dual. And you can use this to not just prove the existence of those triangulations, which I already find a little bit mysterious. So it's not quite clear why those triangulations should exist, right? Um, but you can actually prove this, uh, use this to prove kind of fun applications in various fields of mathematics. And then just have picked one on the next slide. Um, before we go there, I should mention here the honorable mentions. Um, those similar constructions work in any dimension, then you can actually use any metric. I have just sticked here with a, uh, with a Euclidean metric. Okay, so here's a fun application. It's absolutely not clear how this should be related, but it actually is. Uh, so here's a problem, and it's not an easy problem, but it's just a really a problem, again, with points in R2 in this case. You can, again, as I said, generalize it, but you have some seats in R2. So here are some seats, and you're supposed to connect them um, with a tree, so something like this, such that the overall distance of the tree is minimal, okay? So not just any plane tree, but a minimal tree. And again, this is not so clear how to do this. You, want, you don't want to go through all possible trees um, and try to minimize them. So it's this, this problem is called the Euclidean minimal spanning tree. So you want to draw a tree that contains all those seats, all those uh, points that is minimal in distance. Not quite clear how this should uh, how this should work, but actually this tree is a subset of uh, the triangulation of the DT triangulation. So as soon as you can find the DT triangulation, you can actually find this tree very very efficiently, and this kind of solved um, this duality between Voronoi cells and those DT triangulations solved this problem in maybe some version of graph theory. It's not quite discrete graph theory because you're still talking about a distance here, but it's certainly more graph theory than anything else. And it's quite cool. And then you can exploit it to compute this efficiently and you can play around with it and uh, quite quite some, some applications along those lines, which I find a little, little bit surprising. If it would just tell you, um, try to solve this problem, which is not easy. I mean, it seems to be pretty brilliant to connect this to Voronoi cells. Um, I wouldn't have guessed that. So I think this is a pretty cool and very surprising uh, theorem. Anyway, let me wrap up. So Voronoi cells is a surprisingly new notion in some sense. 
Um, as I said, it's not super old. Certainly people have played around with this idea before, but anyway, it's kind of this idea that, well, you have, a pl let's, let's say with a simple setup, you have the plane, you put seats in the plane, you put points in the plane, and you draw those cells around them, kind of containing all points which are closest to a given seat, right? So um, those really cell, but think of biology, biology cell-like picture, and it's kind of, obvious that it is applicable, maybe obvious in huge quotation marks, so what is obvious anyway. Uh, so it's kind of obvious that it is applicable uh, in mathematics, real life, the sciences or whatever. I try to convince you, maybe it wasn't really convincing, but anyway, I try to convince you um, using those airports and supermarkets. I link in the description to way more applications, really beautiful paper applications in science and mathematics of all our cells. And then I kind of picked one that I really like because I found it very surprising, the existence of those triangulations, uh, the minimal triangulations, and um, the dually, the existence of Voronoi cells. One of them was super easy, and one of them was a bit tricky and not quite clear why it should actually exist. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I also hope to see you next time.